Yeah. All right. So today I'm going to wrap up with the proof that the Baker Kaiser functions uh, are uniquely characterized up to a multiple bit of constant by this property. Um, so, and this really is going to go through the theory of holomorphic functions or meromorphic functions on Riemann surfaces. And I'm going to give the statement in uh, for the general case for a general genus. And um, let me just make it more precise. Uh, I have a, my Baker Kaiser function is characterized by the following data. We have, we're going to fix points P1, P2, all the way to PG and P infinity. And this, I'm going to think of them to be distinct and they're going to be generic. They're going to be uh, nice enough. And in here I have this point in the genus G surface. And my Baker or Kaiser function is going to be meromorphic on the surface except for P infinity. At P infinity, this is where I see P infinity is equal to zero in the local coordinate for the local coordinate of uh, of P infinity is going to have an essential sing singularity of this form. And at the points P1 to PG, uh, Psi, my Baker Kaiser function is going to be, uh, it's going to have a simple. And Okay, yeah, so the essential singularities here, I'm actually using the ones that we're doing for the KP uh, equation, but this could be any type of prescribed singularity. It could be a any polynomial type of uh, term inside the exponential. So you can prescribe this. There's some more freedom to do that. And the claim that I'm proving in this um, lecture is going to be that the dimension of the Baker Kaiser functions is going to be equal to one. So they're just going to be multiplicative uh, uh, constants of each other. Uh, they're going to be defined to a multiplicative constant. So uh, again, the idea is that we're going to go through the theory of meromorphic functions on the, on the surface of genus G. And I'll, at the beginning, I'm going to start with recalling some of the things that we've seen, some of the results for holomorphic and meromorphic functions and differentials on the surface G. And then once I have set that up, I'm going to use the Riemann Roth theorem to, to, to give a relation for the dimension of spaces of meromorphic functions. And in particular, this is how we're going to see the dimension of the Baker Kaiser function to be equal to one. And then I'll give a sketch of the proof for the Riemann Rock uh, theorem. And it's, it's somewhat a special case, but it's the case that we're interested in. And yeah. Are you intending to put the x, y independence in those omegas or? Uh, I think it might be a typo. Uh, yeah, let me see what, uh, what is this? Oh, yeah, it's in the book. Yeah, I think I, I just need the X, Y, and C in front of them. Uh, but let me just, I like to correct it if I have an opportunity. So uh, here's the statement in the book. The prescribed singularities or the prescribed, um, so in here, the P infinity course corresponds to just Q1 and one point, but you could potentially have more points with essential singularities. And the essential sing in the neighborhood of the essential singularity, the Baker Kaiser function is going to behave this way, where Q is a polynomial on the local coordinate. So, the general statement. And then let me go to 
the KP, what did we have? I think, yeah, I, I got confused with my notation, but it is XYZ. It should be XYZ. Yeah. Thanks. X, Y. T. What's that? Uh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, that's just X, X, Y, T. The omegas come in. Uh, yeah, when you define it this way, when you have the, the global definition. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's start with the just recalling some of the facts and statements for holomorphic functions and amorphic functions. I'm trying to sketch this result so that not everything's black boxed, so that we have a better feeling of everything. Um, so, first, holomorphic functions for uh, genus G surface. Surface. And the first claim is that if f is holomorphic, then f is constant. Uh, and what I mean by this is that f doesn't have any terms. So uh, this is a simple enough statement that we can grasp. We can have an argument for it. Uh, so in here, I have that f is holomorphic. There's no poles, so that means that I can bound my uh, uh, so I can bound my my uh, homomorphic function, but by some constant. And in particular, if I take the exponential of f, I can uh, say that e of f is going to be homomorphic on sigma. And in particular, that's this is going to be bounded, and it's going to be since sigma is going to be the Riemann surface is compact. There's going to be a point. In the Riemann surface that at, that attains a maximum in the Riemann surface, meaning that for all other points in uh, the Riemann surface, this is going to be an upper bound, and this is where we are going to obtain our contradiction because we're going to show that, that there's no maximums that there's a uh, that in the Riemann surface, um, and because it turns out to be a harmonic function. So to make everything precise, let me take a chart, a local chart around the maximum. So phi is going to be my local chart for a neighborhood around P naught where the maximum is attained into a neighborhood of the complex plane. And I'm going to define the local uh, chart definition of my function F to be, um, to be the to be H. And here, with a loss of generality, I can just assume that U is the disk. And in here, H is going to be holomorphic. It's a holomorphic function from the disk to C. And using the uh, Riemann Cauchy uh, uh, equations, we can show that once we write H, as a real plus imaginary, and the real part is going to be um, harmonic. In particular, this follows from the following observation that the dH dc has to be equal to partial h, partial x, or n minus i partial h, partial y. And this is following this equations, you obtain this two systems of equations that the real and imaginary parts have to satisfy. These are the Cauchy Riemann equations. Is that what's they're called? What they're called, right? Cauchy Riemann. There's so many names that I forget. Uh, so you can now check that the real part is going to be harmonic. You, you start with this on the left hand side, and then you use these identities to make the substitutions and show that 
this is equal to zero. So u of x, y is harmonic. And that's the first fact that we need. Now we have that since uh, we h attains a maximum or f attains a maximum at p0, we're going to have that h attains a maximum at zero since we are centering our coordinate v of p0 is equal to zero. And in particular, when you take the absolute value of the exponential, that's just equal to the e to the real part of h. So that means that we have this identity for all x, y's in all c's in uh, the disk. And in particular, we have that u attains a maximum at the point zero, zero. And this is where we have our contradiction. We consider the Hessian of the u function. And we have that using the fact that it's a harmonic, we compute the Hessian. We can say that this is actually equal to minus u x x squared. So you have minus and minus, so you have a negative Hessian. And that means that we have a saddle point at the point zero, zero. X equals zero, zero is a saddle point. So this is what we have for you. And this is our contradiction because we have the zero, zero is a max and a saddle point. So this, it can't, it can't, this contradiction tells us that zero, zero can't be a, Maximum, so h must be a constant. So this is a it's called the maximum principle of uh, of of harmonic functions that the maximum has to be attained in the boundary. And here we're some assuming that we've attained the maximum in the middle, which is not possible. So we have the homomorphic functions are constant. So. We're getting a first, our first taste of classifying functions on our Riemann surface. We've classified the homomorphic ones. They're just gonna be constants. Now we are moving on to classifying the meromorphic functions or knowing more about them and then differential forms. So now moving to meromorphic functions, this are, uh, Homomorphic functions with bolts or a meromorphic function between the Riemann surface and CP1. So a homomorphic function that could take values at infinity. Uh, I'm gonna define the index of a function to be the number of zeros minus the number of poles. And the claim here is that, thanks sorry, red. That the index of a meromorphic function is going to be equal to zero. So the idea here for this proof is that if we have um, if we have a genus G surface, I can cut it into its its um, essential its into its uh, fundamental polygon, where the identification is given here. This is actually for G equals to two, and if I identify this with this, this with this, this with this, and this with this, then I recover this. And I can compute the index of my function taking the, taking the um, contour integral of the log derivative of my function f. So I take the integral around this way, and this is going to give me the the index of my function. It's gonna count the poles and zeros inside the region. But, so this is gonna give me an equality going this way by just doing the contour integral around, but then doing, noticing that this and this are identified with opposite orientations. I can see that this and this are gonna cancel out. This is gonna cancel out with this. This is gonna cancel out with this. This is gonna cancel out with this and this is gonna cancel out with this. So if I actually perform the contour integral, I'm gonna get zero. So I get that the uh, number of zeros and the number of poles is going to be equal for meromorphic functions. 
So this is another fact that's useful when thinking about paramorphic functions on the Riemann surface. And now let's move on to holomorphic one forms. And in here, let's do the, this is I'm gonna, this is when I'm gonna get started to get a little bit more hand waving. Uh, a holomorphic one form is gonna be a holomorphic map or a suction from the Riemann surface to its cotangent bundle. Uh, and here I'm gonna denote the space of holomorphic one forms to be H superscript one zero. And in particular, what we have here is that if B is a tangent vector at a point X in Sigma, then Omega of X, the one form acts on the tangent vector DX and gives you a scalar. So essentially it's, it's for every X Omega is going to, it's essentially a length function, a complex length function. So it's gonna be a homomorphic length function. So for each tangent space, it's gonna give you distances. So complex distances. And the facts that we need are the following for the proof of the Riemann rock. Uh, first, that the dimension of the homomorphic one forms is equal to G. And the index of a homomorphic one form is going to be 2G minus 2. And here, the index again is the number of zeros minus, minus the number, so number of poles. And this is going to be true for any omega. And this I change notation for any homomorphic one form. And I mean, right away you can tell that one forms are going to be different than meromorphic functions. Their index indexes are indices are different. Uh, meromorphic functions are have index zero, and one forms have index two uh, g minus two. So in here I'm. Just going to try to sketch this fax. Uh, and in particular, I'm gonna, I like to think more of the of the case uh, genus G equals one. But so for all Riemann surfaces, we're gonna have a unique homomorphic non-degenerate two form. Uh, this is going to be a section on on the Riemann surface that instead of taking one uh, argument, the for each x, it acts on a pair of vectors. And, and so instead of just taking one, it takes a pair of vectors. And it gives you, it returns a complex area. So it, with the two vectors, it's going to return a number, which you can think of it as a complex area. So it's an area function that's uh, homomorphically defined around each point. And this is going to be my two form. And this is for every, and this is for every tangent. This is the tangent vectors. Uh, and I introduced this and in, this idea because uh, this, and the non degenerate really means that this, uh, that this. Uh, area function on the vectors is only going to be equal to zero if the vectors are parallel. So the parallel, the parallelogram that you create with Vx and Wx, uh, if the two form is equal to zero, then it means that they're parallel. Otherwise, it's going to give you a non-trivial uh, area for this, uh, for any pair of non-trivial vectors Vx and W. And in uh, this non-degenerate two form, it's actually I'm introducing it based on a comment that Tom made in I guess the first lecture that you can really think about one forms as vector fields, and the way to go from one form from one forms to vector fields is using this non degenerate homomorphic one form where you can think where you can do a pairing and 
for every differential form, there's going to be a corresponding uh, differential vector field that's induced by this pairing. And in particular, for the genus one case, instead of thinking of one forms to classify the space of one forms, we can think of the vector fields in, uh, in our genus G surface. So, so that we have vector fields that go like this, or we have vector fields that go like this. So this is easier to picture and motivate. And additionally, we have that if we define H1 to be the space of differential vector fields, H10 to be the homomorphic vector fields, and H01 to be the space of anti-homomorphic vector fields, we're going to have a decomposition of the differential vector fields into a direct sum of differential and, I mean, into homomorphic plus anti-homomorphic. And additionally, we're going to have that the dimensions of the homomorphic and anti-homomorphic have to equal to each other. This is by complex conjugation. If you have something that's homomorphic, you take the complex conjugate, you get something anti-homomorphic. And in particular, for this case of the genus one, we have two linearly independent um, vector fields. So one is going to be a vector field that goes around the circle this way. And the other one is going to be in a, a vector field that goes around the circle this way. So we're going to obtain that, in general, that the dimension of the differential vector fields is going to be 2G. And by this relations, we get that the dimension of the holomorphic vector fields is equal to G. And in particular, this tells me that the dimension of the space of holomorphic one forms is equal to G. And in here, this argument, I can change holomorphic to holomorphic or anti-homorphic to anti-homorphic. So in here, this is the first statement that I want to prove or can I motivate? This is, I'm not going through all the details, but at least motivated for the case G equals to one, then this, this, the space of homomorphic one forms is equal to G. Uh huh. Right, but then the kind of vector field kind of point in either the, like the real part kind of point in a direction. Yeah. The matter part. Yeah. So. Yeah, so those are going to be the two. So That's we can think. The real and the matter part. Yeah. So I guess you would want a parallelogram, but. Uh -oh. Oh, this. And yeah, so you can, here you're gonna have a vector field that goes up, that's one vector field. And then the other one, you can have something that goes like this. And those are the two vector fields for the torus. Yeah, that's a good, way to think about it. For the torus, it's fairly clear. I still have a hard time drawing all the vector fields for a genus G surface. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I tried to do it in this case, using the picture, but maybe using parallelograms or the fundamental polynomial might be simpler, but at least for G equals one, I'm convinced. Yeah, it's fairly good model and description. Um, then the next thing that I wanted to do is that show that the index of the one forms is 2G minus two. And in here, uh, you have, if I take, first I wanna show that the index is gonna be constant among the 
meromorphic among uh, the one forms, uh, holomorphic one forms. So I take a pair of them and I divide them. I divide one by the other, and I'm going to obtain a meromorphic function as a result. The differential part is going to cancel out from both the top and the bottom, and the result is just going to be a meromorphic function on sigma on my Riemann surface. And the index function is additive. So I can really say that if I'm counting the zeros and poles of the ratio is really equal to the zeros of poles of omega minus the zeros and poles of omega prime. So I have that this the index of this is equal to this. But additionally, the, I know that this is a meromorphic function and we know that the index of meromorphic functions is equal to zero. So in here we have that the index of this two one forms is equal to each other. So we have that it's constant for every omega in the space of homomorphic one forms. And, and then, then the way to see that the index has to be two G minus two is that the index of the one form is really going to correspond to the zeros of the vector field. And for instance, in here, if we take this vector field of just pointing down that like, I guess wraps around. So if you detach the top and the bottom, you just have something that wraps around, around the torus and it's never equal to zero. So this differential form is not gonna have any zeros and it's not gonna have any poles. And you can see that for the torus, the index is gonna be zero, which matches this formula. Um, in general, you can go through the Lefschetz fixed point theorem. Lefschetz fixed point theorem, and do a self intersection of the of this surface of the of a self intersection of the Riemann surface, and get the formula for the index. And in particular, if you have a if you have a, a vector field, then what you can do is use the vector field to shift everything, to do shift all the points in, to, in the surface and kind of create a, another copy of it that intersects itself. And then you count the intersection points. And with the left shift fixed point theorem, that's a topological invariant and then you can count the index, but this is going more into algebraic topology. But um, the, the idea to count the, a specific way that you can count this index, it, it is through uh, going through the vector fields and using this left shift fixed point theorem. But this is going to be a, another important result that we'll use in our proofs. Um, so by now I've been talking about zeros and pulse. Of my of my meromorphic functions and differential forms, and I might introduce this this uh, notion of divisors. And in particular, is a way to note to keep track of the poles and zeros in a in a precise way. And and here. A divisor, I'm going to, it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially a bookkeeping technique more than anything. And a divisor is going to be, a divisor is going to be a finite integer linear combination of points in my surface. So it's going to be expressed as a sum of points where the NJs are NJs are going to be integers. And one particular way that you can create uh, divisors is by taking the zeros and the poles of the, excuse me, of the uh, function of a function F or a one form. This could also be, you can also do omega instead of F. And in here, NP is gonna represent the number of the order of the zero at point P 
and MP is going to represent the order of the pole at point P. So in here, this is really the this is really the information we want to keep track for these types of functions, the poles and the zeros. And in here, this these are going to be and if a divisor is is maybe written as a it may it's given by a function, then you by a meromorphic function, then this is going to be a principal divisor. And in general, not all devices are going to be principal. So you can have a linear combination of so points that are don't arise as the zeros and poles of a function. So I'm introducing divisors here to just kind of uh, for bookkeeping of zeros and poles. Uh, and let me introduce more notation. Uh, now it's the degree of a divisor. So if I have my divisor D as this finite sum, then the degree is going to be the sum of the coefficients, n1 through nk. Uh, so, and it's often denoted as the letter D for the degree. And in particular, with this notation, if we have a divisor that's given by the by a function, a meromorphic function, the degree is in particular equal to the index of f. It's equal to the number of pole, of zeros minus the poles. And we've already shown that the degree for meromorphic functions, divisors of meromorphic functions, is equal to zero. Um, so this is uh, this is where we're trying to start characterizing or describing spaces of meromorphic functions in a, in a uh, Riemann surface with prescribed poles and zeros. And, and here, I'm going to introduce the space LD, which is going to be the space of meromorphic functions on sigma such that the divisor of f plus d is greater than or equal to zero, which uh, this is this should be a minus, which really means that once I add these two divisors together, the coefficients of these divisors all have to be greater than or equal to zero. And we're gonna call L to be the L of D to be the dimension of that. And this is uh, getting closer to our statement on the Baker exit function because we prescribe where the poles are. And but this is not really saying anything about the central singularities, but we'll be able to get rid of those with the specific thing. And so this is the type of space that we want to determine. And for the Baker Kaiser function, this to show that the space of Baker Kaiser functions is equal to one, then, uh, then what we want to do is compute the dimension of a specific LD for a specific choice of D. And for that, we need the Riemann Rocket theorem. Uh, theorem, so I'm gonna, and this is Riemann Rock. So we're gonna take any divisor D and we're gonna let K be the divisor given by uh, the homomorphic, a homomorphic one form. Then this dimension of the space of, of uh, the dimension of the space of homomorphic functions with, with divisors with this prescribed poles and zeros minus this dimension is gonna be the degree of D plus one minus G. So this is the formula. So here we're gonna start relating the, um, we're gonna get set formula for the dimensions of the spaces and we're gonna be able to use this formula to get a precise formula for, um, for the space of bigger vector functions. Uh, the idea of, of this proof is really to, is that I take a function 
in LD, L cap, capital LD, so uh, uh, function with prescribed pole structure, pole and series structure given by D. And I try to control the residue around the points in D. And if I can control that the structure, the the structure of the residues around that pulse, then that's going to give me enough information to figure out everything I need about my function. Um, this is similar to uh, the proof. This is similar, like a similar idea to the proof that a bounded homomorphic function is constant, and that where you can use a residue theorem to actually show that it has to be constant by controlling the residue of that function and knowing that the function is bounded. So in here, we're gonna go through some residue computations to actually show this equality. And I'm gonna focus on a specific case. Uh, I think the general proof is, uh, The general proof is, is uh, probably more technical, um, but in this case, things simplify and there, there are more elementary arguments to show this statement. Um, so I'm just gonna set D to equal to a sum of D distinct points and the coefficient in front of each point is gonna be equal to one. Uh, this is going to tell me that the degree of D is really D. And in here, the space capital L of D is going to be homomorphic function, homomorphic functions F with a worst simple pulse of PJs. So this is prescribing the pulse structure of my, of my functions. The zeros can be anything, and, but the, but the uh, poles there can only be at most D poles and they can only be at worst simple. So this is going to be the specific case that I'm, that I'm gonna consider. And this is the case that applies to the Baker-Kaiser function. Does this make sense? Uh, I think it's the other way around. So capital D is space, and lowercase l is dimension. Oh, okay. yeah, the other way around. Yeah. So we have, we're trying to figure out the dimension of the space, and this is the space, uh, the space that we will need for the Baker Kaiser function. Um, so. I'm going to do it through a residue map. So I'm going to define a map from the space of these functions to the copies of the complex plane by taking residues at the different D points. And this is a, a little tricky, uh, in particular because this the proof is coordinate dependent but the result is coordinate independent. So in here, I'm gonna, to, cause to actually define this residue map, you, you need to, uh, it's, it's tricky to define the residue of functions uh, globally or coordinate independent in the, in the uh, Riemann surface. But what you do is to make it precise is that you actually fix a set of coordinates around each of the points of the divisor. And in here I'm gonna have this J coordinates where J goes from one to D. And so that at the, the J coordinate PJ is equal to zero. And I'm gonna define the residue J of F is going to be the residue at zero at CJ is equal to zero. CJ is equal to zero of this function in written and local coordinates. And in here I am making a choice and I am fixing local coordinates, but I'm making these computations locally. 
So given that, I can then define my residue map to be the D-tuple of the residues around all PJ points. So this is gonna be my map. And the way that I find out the dimension of LD is through, again, index theorem. So this, the residue map is a linear map. So I obtained that the dimension of LD is going to be equal to the dimension of the image of this map plus the dimension of the kernel. So this is just linear algebra. And what I do now is I figure out what the dimension of the image is and figure out the dimension of the kernel. And the way that's gonna work out, this is simple to do. This one, I'm gonna do a lower and uh, upper bound, but that's gonna be enough to give me the result. So the first thing that we have is for this residue map is that the kernel is just going to be the constant functions. So it's just gonna be one dimensional, it's just gonna be C. And this can actually be seen fairly straightforward. We have that if, if F is in the kernel, then the image is gonna be zero, zero, zero. And that means that uh, the residue at each of the points PJ is equal to zero. That means that it has no poles. And the only places where it may have poles, since it's an LD, is at this PJ, so that means no poles. So that means that it has no zeros. So that means that it's constant. So this is going back to our original statement that holomorphic functions on Riemann surfaces are constant. So this is going to be my kernel is going to be one dimensional. So it's gonna be C, the constant functions. That's the easy one. Now, next we consider the image. And we're gonna take a holomorphic one form, omega, and we're gonna write in local coordinates and for the different PJs. And again, the local coordinates were fixed from the very beginning. And, but, uh, so we have this expansion and this Gs are defined by the local coordinates. But on the other hand, this product F times omega it's actually a meromorphic one form. So this is actually globally defined. So in this case, you can actually have a well-defined residue around each of the points PJ that is coordinate independent. And by the residue theorem, the sum of the residues of this meromorphic one form has to equal to zero. So in particular, we have that this residue by the residue theorem is gonna to have to equal to zero. But if we write in local coordinates, we're gonna have that it's going to be equal to this sum where this is the resident in local coordinates times the value of the differential form at, at the PJs. So this is gonna be give me a condition for the image of my rescue map. So, if, uh, so I'm mapping uh, my residue map, maps F to this set of points, residues zero of F C1. So it maps it to a D tuple, residue zero F C D. It map, maps it to a D tuple in C D but in the image, they have to satisfy this linear condition where the G, J zeros are some coefficients that are given by, by the local expression of my differential W. So this is a restrictive condition that's gonna bring down the dimension of the image and it's gonna bring it down by one because it's a linear condition. Well, that's if, so this is, this is gonna be a condition, but we actually have to be careful because this condition may be trivial in the case that all these coefficients are equal to zero. So to, so in here, what's happening is that for each 
So the dimension of the image is going to be uh, for the image, the image is going to sit in C D. It's in the D tuple. So we already know that the dimension of the image is going to be less than or equal to D. And for each of these relations, we're going to bring it down by one. And we actually have um, we have G independent homomorphic one forms. So this is so we uh, potentially we could have up to G relations that are going to each bring the dimension down by one. So potentially we could have D minus G as the upper bound for the image, which is brought down once for each for each of these relations. But there is this fact that the condition may be trivial. So the this coefficients might all be zero. So I think so we also have to to actually make the upper bound precise, we have to add a correction. And we need to account for the cases when all the coefficients are equal to zero. So this is what we need to take care of. So in particular, I introduce this space, L tilde minus D, which is the space of all one forms that vanish at the PJs. This is what's gonna to lead to a trivial condition. And in here, what I have is that if F is a homomorphic function with the pole structure described by this divisor, then I can multiply it times a one form, a homomorphic one form. This W is a homomorphic one form. And I can map Fs from here to the homomorphic functions from here to here, to the space of, um, to the space of one forms that vanish with PJ. And then by computing the divisor, it's additive, I can show that this divisor is going to be equal to D. So I obtain that, and you can also go the other way by dividing FW by W. So I obtained that actually the space of all one forms that vanish at PJ is isomorphic to the space of neuromorphic functions with this poles, with this divisor structure. So in particular, I get that the dimension of this space is equal to the dimension of this space of meromorphic functions with this divisors. And so this is gonna be my lowercase l k minus d. And this is gonna be my correction term. So this is a, the correction term. So now, as I had before, I had that uh, the image is bounded by D or the dimension of the target space. And then each of the relations uh, given by meromorphic one form is gonna subtract uh, one dimension from the image, but we need to add the correction term because there's gonna be trivial conditions. So we have that it's gonna be D minus G plus L K minus D. So in here, we have that G minus L K minus D are the non-trivial relations given by this. So now we have that the image, uh, these are the dimensions, Dimension, dimension of the image of the kernel is gonna be D minus G plus L of K minus D. So uh, actually this is a upper bound. 
we didn't show that these were all the relations and that they were all non-trivial. We just gave it up to a correction. And in particular, there might be more relations that bring the dimension down potentially. So what we have is this upper bound and we need to show that it's an equality. And this is where it gets a little cute. You apply that equality to the divisor. You set the divisor equal to K minus D. So, and this is a, yeah, K minus D. This is a little bit more subtle. And this is where I'm sweeping things under the rug because I'm only proving it for positive divisors or effective divisors. But uh, potentially you can make this, uh, if, D, if D is less than two G minus two, then you could actually make this uh, work in this setting. But I'm just gonna assume that it now holds. And for all divisors, that inequality. And so now I have that the degree of K minus D is equal to two G minus two minus D. It's a degree of this minus the degree of this. So the degree of two G minus two is the index degree of K is equal to just the index of omega. Uh, the two form, and we show that the index is equal to 2g minus 2 earlier, and then the index of d, we set it to be equal to d. So if we apply the inequalities from the previous slide to this divisor, we have that we get 1 plus d minus g, and now l minus l of, what is it, d minus k minus d is going to be just ld. So we simplify and we get this inequality for this. And then we apply again the previous inequality for LD from the previous slide. And we actually get L of K minus D back. So I get that L of K minus D is less than or equal to L of K minus D. And the only way that this is not a contradiction is if all the inequalities here are equalities. So I obtain that this is my formula. So now I obtained the, the equality. So I didn't find all the relations, but I found enough to make the inequalities tight. And that gives me the proof. So really, what we this proof, you go and control the residue structure and you consider the residue structure of your of your um, of your functions and you see that, and in here in the residue map, you see that the information to determine, I guess here, the information necessary to determine uh, this, uh, this space, it's going to be, you're gonna consider its image and it's gonna be an image of points uh, that sit in a subspace of, bit of this space with prescribed relations, and we gave all the relations. And so we have a precise description of LD as the image, and we have this uh, equality. So let me now, any questions before I move on to the baker kaiser function? Okay, so now, to the argument of the Baker Kaiser function. Um, and here again, we have switch these uh, x, y, t. And I forgot to add the other points. This is for general genus G, P2, PG. Mm. We have the Baker Kaiser functions defined by these properties. Um, first, we fix points, and they're all distinct. Uh, psi is meromorphic for, uh, for the points in sigma except for P infinity. And psi has a specific structure as a specific central singularity near P infinity. And we have simple poles. 
around P1 through PG. And the claim here is, again, that the dimension of this space is equal to one. So the proof goes as follows. We have, we take one of the functions of, uh, in the baker Kaiser space. Uh, in here, the BVIM book actually gives you a construction of a function here. So we can assume that there is at least one, one function in there. And now we consider any other function in this set of baker Kaiser functions. And we consider the ratio of these two functions, psi over psi naught. And this function is actually going to be in this space of um, L of P1 to PG, which is going to be our divisor D in the Riemann Rock theorem. And where the P tilde J's are going to be the zeros of the denominator. And this is going to be, this is going to tell us that it's going to have poles at this point. And this are by what we've, uh, but, but what we've done, we have that the baker kaiser function has poles exactly at this point. So it has poles. So if we go back, uh, we have that the baker kaiser function has poles, G poles. And it has exactly G poles. And since we know that the poles and the zeros are equal to each other, the number of poles and the zeros, we're going to have uh, this many zeros here. And these are going to be this, the, the, um, these are going to be the poles that arise. And then the poles of this are going to cancel out with the poles of this. So we're really going to have that this lives in this space, precisely in this space with this divisor. So the Riemann rock now tells us that the dimension of this space is given by this formula. And, uh, and we know what D is, we know what G is, what we need to figure out is this dimension. And going back to the proof uh, of the Riemann rock, we have that this dimension was the dimension of the, they call it tilde, uh, of homomorphic one forms that vanish at this point, at these points. And in fact, we can actually think of this space and compute the dimension of this space because we know that there's G independent uh, homomorphic one forms. And if we have a homomorphic one form has near combination of this homomorphic one forms, and it has to be equal to zero at all these points. So it's gonna give me a system of equations whose solution is just gonna be zero. So this is the, the only solution for this system of equations is gonna be zero, so the dimension is gonna be zero. So I can now plug in all the values for the riemann rock formula. This is zero, G, and I obtain one. So this gives me that the dimension of the baker guys. So this tells me that this space is uh, one dimensional and really says that this is a constant. Psi, psi zero is equal to C is equal to a constant. Psi, psi zero is equal to a constant. So the one dimension, so psi is C times psi zero. So they're uniquely determined up to a constant. And that's it. So now we, we know that the space of the function is one dimension. Questions? All right. For different part of the differential equation, you will have to divide a different. Uh, how do you divide the Kaiser and Taylor function? Uh, for different non-normal KDV or, or miniature zero, 
Uh, yeah, so I, I do believe, I, I don't know how to do it, but I think that's where the art comes in into like figuring this method stuff. I, I think Pat has a better idea of how to do that because you work with other Baker types of functions, right? Yeah, yeah. So work with the construction of the cars. I work through the laws of construction and stuff, but I'm not trying to take space from it. That was a while ago. It was like 8 feet that was like a hundred. So the next time I'll discuss that issue with you, how you got the initial solution. But with the KP equation, uh, so the KP is a reduction of the K to K. Uh -huh. Right, so it's Y dependent, then you get K and K, right? Uh -huh. So it's method of the Y dependent solution. And essentially, that hyperlogic curve with real range points, right, that comes from essentially the KDB reduction and real. Uh, real. Yeah. Uh -huh. But and I guess something that seems important to me or where there's more freedom is the structure of the essential singularity. So in this case, we have the essential singularity only at P infinity and of this structure, but you can have multiple essential singularities at different points and have the same structure, and that's not give you a different class of data functions. So those would probably give you maybe a different uh, uh, I'm going to give you a different uh, PDU or something like this. Well, if you're doing a, uh, the Kaprara system, you have two, or a nonlinear Kroger equation, you have two points at infinity because you have a double sheet of cover, but you have an even number of finite branch points in all those cases. And then, right, in that case, you have two points, and what you do is you normalize the base your K zero. One point and then to be one times the essential singularity, and just say it has the other kind of essential singularity at the other point, and then you get some condition that connects yeah. them. And so, yeah, for the analysis, but the analysis is also a vector value Baker Kaiser function, too. So, yeah, I think there's still yeah, so I think that's a good question to like characterize the Baker Kaiser function in the way that. PD. I haven't thought about it exactly. I just like think about it at hoc at this point. But the other thing that I think it's interesting the way that I think about this Baker Kaiser functions, I think in analogous way to exponential functions in the complex plane. And the way that like you can use exponential functions to solve a lot of PDs and ODs. And like a lot of the uh, linear OD theory goes through exponential functions. And this is the analogous object. There's a specific like function with an essential singularity, kind of like the exponential function has an essential singularity infinity that like, solves differential equations. But it's a generalization in the other Riemann surface. In the singular case, um, and the third one is. Solid times, you can come up with something that has an analogy to the Baker Kaiser function that's just a rational function times an exponential as well. I'll, be, I'll mention that next week or next week. I guess, and speaking of singularity, and, uh, I think another way that you can change things is by, uh, I guess, having more of it changing the simple whole condition, but I'm not sure if that's not like. Change the dimension of your space. So that might change the dimension of your space, but you really don't want to. So another place where you can try to change the vector crisis function is that the full structure. They could be, I'm not sure if it, you could have like uh, order two fold, uh, one of the two PIs. Then that would be something different. All right, I think we're done.